So, you know, just a reminder, uh, we last time, which was now two weeks ago, I did um, chapter seven and environments. And, you know, we covered most of like kind of, I would say, you know, the first half of it or so. We talked about this idea of scoping. We talked about some, you know, uh, this idea of different environments and parent environments and, um, you know, having names and, and, and value uh, bindings and, um, yeah, and so uh, without going into all, and also we talked about super assignment, which is, um, you know, instead of modifying something in the current environment, we get to modify it in the um, parent environment. Um, and it may, that was one of our first references to this idea of a function factory, which I'm excited to learn more about that. But, um, yeah, so, oh, and also um, we learned that super assignment doesn't, um, Create a variable. Um, it it, uh, it just modifies uh, the value. We talked about that. Okay. So anyway, um, I think we finished. Okay. So basically, where I finished last time was this idea of special environments, um, and basically they talk about two sort of types of special environments: package environments and function environments. Um, so. Um, I think at one point they, he, he mentions, um, something like, you know, if we actually had to load and like, a, kind of like a library load type of a thing for each function in a package, that would be a real pain in the butt. So a lot of this is sort of meant to be, um, a way of, um, sort of helping us, you know, um, keep track of where things are. Um, so this, this idea of namespaces, which, you know, um, I only really know because I have taken like some like data camp and stuff. I've done some like light kind of like, this is how you make a package. I'm not sure if anyone else has done this. I, I've never made a package as we've talked about. That's my goal. But this idea is always like a namespaces um, folder, which I think connects these to uh, the fa the package and, and function environments. Um, and I, I believe, I, I think I mentioned the last time or the time before this idea of the conflicted package, which is one, I think one of the ways of sort of dealing with this where we have multiple functions named the same thing, which can be a huge pain in the butt. Um, all right. Um, they also talked about this idea of package environments and the search path. Um, and we, we we also talked about this idea that you know when you load a package it becomes apparent to the um, the the, um, the global environment. Sorry, I wanted to show that one thingy. Oh, yeah. which oh well, I mean I guess you can kind of see it here, right? Like where we have in order these are the you know between you know we have the global, then we have our lang, we have all these things that happened in that order. And it's just something to sort of take note of. Um, there was another figure that I was trying to, to find, but I all this, oh, well, I mean, this is another way of kind of looking at that, right? So see the global environment, and then we have all of our, um, um, you know, parents, right? And so the parent of, of um, the package is the second to last package you attached, right? So. Um, that's the, sort of the sequencing that we we talked about. Um, oh, thanks. Sorry, that's chapter eight. Um, okay, so yeah, so one of the things that you might want to do, and this, by the way, is like what I used to do. Some version of this when I before I learned conflicted, I would be like, you know, why is it that when I'm running, you know, the filter function, I'm getting some really weird error, or it's not behaving the way I expect? And say dplyr. I mean, sure we, I'm sure we've all had this, right? So I used to do some version of this, although why is this now? Um, huh. Let me make sure I ran this. Um, yeah, so I mean, this just tells you, you know, these are the things that I've got loaded and um, obviously in the order in which they are loaded. So just, yeah, actually, hold on. So make make, make sure I'm understanding this. So the last thing we loaded was the Rlang package, which makes sense, right? Because I made a call to the library. And then, so all these other things are already um, 
I'm assuming these things are already just like loaded in the environment, sort of when you open a, a pro, uh, 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 by the way, I am doing like a, an R project file. So maybe that's sort of standard. I don't know if anyone else had any thoughts about that, but um, another way to do this in the book they talk about is this, this is a little fancier from the Arlang package. And it, the only difference is, is um, well, it just kind of looks, you know, fan, like, I guess it's more like a list Whereas this is just a vector, I don't know. Um, any, yeah, it's, any... it's it's going to depend on a couple things. Like, I mean, you can modify like your dot R profile. Like, there's a file. Oh file yeah, R profile that you could like automatically bring in, like you know, packages. So it's going to be different depending on if you have a customized setup for that. But you're you're basically right. Like, it's it's starting with the empty environment, and then mm -hmm. it goes into loads in base. And I'm not necessarily sure what auto loads is, but then I it brings mean, in methods, data sets, utils, da, 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 up all the way up to the global environment. Right. So yeah, you had that part, right? It, it Depending on what these are, though, it's going to depend on what your setup is. Um, but yeah, I think you nailed it right on the head. <laughs> Do you do you do you do that? Do you modify your own R profile thing? Because I've I read about that and I have like a bunch of like things that I've tagged to like get to, but I've never done it. Do you do that? Yeah, I change a couple things. Um, I'm actually writing a blog post about it. Um, oh, dude, send, can you send, send, put, put your blog in the the, um, the chat. I want to follow. I mean, yeah, <laughs> I have always like wanted to write blog posts and I actually have started to write a bunch of blog posts on things and I just never have. And so I'm like, yeah. Yeah, I'm trying to get more content going, but there's there's an example that I've I've kind of pulled from, and I'll send this one. It's not done yet, so I'm still finishing no up that portion of it. It's probably going to be in another couple of weeks, but it's off of this one, and it kind of talks about like. Maybe you I'll send it to you. Yeah, you want, yeah go ahead. Yeah, I'll drop it in the chat for you. So Ooh. this was by two people. It talks about like setting up like dot files. So Ron might be familiar with like dot files and everything, but it basically talks about your dot part of it is the dot r profile and how you can kind of set that up but yeah i yeah i mean that that's something that you can do to influence your search path right so you yeah. can set you can influence the and that's just for your session right and so right. um but i think that's important though because when you're developing a package one thing you need to consider especially when it comes to this and namespaces and how those like mm -hmm. how those naming conventions work and how environments work is you don't necessarily know what landscape your package is going into. You don't know what your right. user, you know, so you don't know what their setup is. And so you have to have some convention environments to make sure that you can keep those things separated or at least flagged to know when those conflicts are happening. So, yeah. Very true. Um, Oh, and then uh, this was one of the uh, quiz questions. How is search and ENVs different from ENV parents? Um, I actually didn't even run this, so I don't even know. But does anybody know the answer? So this is search underscore ENVs. This is, um, oh, sorry. This is ENV parents. I can't remember. I think it has to do with the fact that the parents go back further up or something i can't remember now all right let's see um oh yeah it goes up one more further up <laughs> that's what it is oh and it also has a it also it also includes an empty environment at the end yeah. oh oh wait a minute so that there's no oh i see so you're you're saying okay in this case you're saying give me all the parents of the global environment so don't even include number the number one all right okay so it's just basically like you're not including the entire list of environments. You're saying relative to um, the global environment, what are the parents? Okay, that's good. Um, so next, we get into this idea of the function environment. So you know where we bind um, you know the function to the current environment and is used for lexical scoping, which we've you know we sort of talked about. Uh, we also talked a bit about closures. Is that, by the way, is it, is it closures or is it closure? I've heard different things. Have you heard any? I've only heard closure. Closure. Okay, good, good. Yeah. One of the things I don't really, I didn't really get, like, so the functions that capture or enc enclose their environments, I didn't really know what that meant other than, like, what is it? Like, capture and enclose means it's, like, you know, self-contained, but I don't, yeah, I don't know. Um, Basically, I mean, just the fact that when you create a function in R and many other languages, 
Mm-hmm. Not only does the fun the function has attached to it this environment that it was defined in, right? So yeah. remember those what those things were, as opposed to some early languages which would use this, you know, uh, not lexical scoping, but rather dynamic scoping, where it wouldn't capture any environment and whatever those variables happened to be at the time you ran the function, that's what they were. <laughs> so. Wow. <laughs> yeah, that's um. Does that does that go back with the idea of like the first class, like the first class functions or something idea like? Yeah, it does. It does indeed. Like a, a true first class, like or a language that has first class functions would enclose their environments, right? There yeah. is no ability yeah. to transfer Wait. variables outside of environments or not, right? Are you talking about like other languages that are, first, I mean, do we talk about first class functions in R or is it more just like a kind of like a. Um, yeah, we did la- during the functions we, chapter, I think. Did we? Oh, okay. Yeah, sorry. Right. I think it comes up again. I mean, I've kind of read, he- I read ahead a little bit, but then somebody, I remember coming across like the idea of like first class functions, right? And first class yeah. languages that exhibit first class characteristics. I'm not sure the exact term. You know, I don't, think, I don't know if there is one, but yeah, that's close. That's good enough. Yeah, something like that. So, like, it's just, I think it's like a bring over from like other languages. You know, most people are used to them called closures, but they're also known as functions. So, it's like a synonym, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So, one of the things um, that they mentioned was every namespace environment has the same set of ancestors, which, you know, kind of makes sense if, you know, we're talking about these like parent ideas. Um, so I like, I, I put these in here because I just kind of liked them because I kind of understood it, but I also didn't kind of understand. So explicitly importing every base function, which I kind of mentioned, that's, you know, be a to do that at an individual functional level um, would be tiresome. So the parent of the imports environment is the base um, namespace, right? So, the, remember the namespace is the thing that links functions and packages. So um, the base namespace contains the same bindings as the base environment, but has it has a different parent, um, which is in this case, you know, the global environment. Um, yeah, I don't know why, but this this bugged me. I couldn't understand. I'm with you, and this whole section about the namespace is uh, kind of like. Yeah, I, I meant to write I down. I had trouble keeping it in my head for more than about four seconds. <laughs> yeah, so, so, okay, so he's basically saying this means that if the binding isn't defined in the imports environment, the package will look for it in an unusual way. This is usually a bad idea, right? Because it couldn't, you know, like to your point about, um, you know, like if if people are, you know, starting with different setups, you know, with, with, there might be unintended yeah. sort of behavior, right? Um, so this is usually a bad idea. So, um, our command check automatically warns about such code is prim. Um, okay. Yeah. So I think this this pertains to, and I think this pertains to like package development. So like if you dig into like any package, there's a file in a package. So right now I'm just looking at the at dplyr. Mm-hmm. It has it has a namespace file, so that when a and I'm just going to send the link to it. Yeah. So basically, it's like I think what it's basically saying is is like you have to have this, this basically puts these functions into the environment that you're using. And so it would be really, really tedious to keep doing like double colon notation where it's like dplyr colon colon. And so to make it convenient, what R does is it's just like, okay, if you attach this package, make all these functions available and you don't have to like, you know, explicitly reference it. I think that's what it's saying. But I'm yeah. not 100% sure. Yeah. It's, it's, it, what's interesting, though, is, is okay, so like, uh, you know, I'm like, this is still, I'm still kind of learning about S3 stuff, but I think what it's this whole pig, it, by the way, you all can see this, right? You can see like, I, yes. Okay, good, good. Um, so we're basically saying, like, um, we're saying the, the filter function is applicable to time series or data dot frames or, or, or tibbles. I think so you're not really sort of linking. F- uh, functions to packages you're linking functions to data types is that fair to say part of what's happening here uh i, I well i mean scroll down a little bit like th- these are talking about s3 but like if you go down there's like export like oh. basically what these are doing is it's like there's functions defined in this package in the r directory 
right, right, and right. so to bring those in once you attach the package as a new like library d plier you're uh -huh. attaching the package and when you attach the package this namespace file gets referenced to which then brings in like the function definition in the r directory uh, i think that's what it's saying <laughs> right right yeah no believe me oh and then also yeah so this is telling you import okay yeah so so this was kind of getting what you're at with like when you do import from, so like this is a good example of like the Magritte pipe. You can see like this package is importing Magritte and it's yeah. imp it's importing the pipe from Magritte yeah. into into like the the landscape yeah. of your, of the of the R session. By the way, this is just what I was talking about when I talk about conflicted. So you would use the word conflicted here as the function call and then you would say, "Hey, um well, it's actually a little bit different, but yeah, so you'd have the function first and then you'd have the package that you want to affiliate it. But here you're saying, listen, uh, just load the glue function from the glue package, which is super useful, by the way. Um, and same thing with yeah. the <laughs> um, Yeah, a guy in Cleveland actually made uh, the glue package. Um, Jim, um, I forget what his name, he left our studio, but um, okay, well, yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, I guess it kind of makes sense. I'm, I'm, I'm still I'm getting there. Okay. And then we talked after a package, um, or excuse me, function environment, we talked about execution environment, which we've kind of alluded to because we've talked about a little bit of like, you know, once you run the function, it kind of like, you know, it, it resets itself. We, I think we've made reference to that. So, um, so, right. So like once the function is completed, the environment will be, will be garbage collected. Um, I like that. So, um, yeah, and so one of the things that we can do to extend um, this idea of the of the um, execution environment is um, here. So you can explicitly return it by having this current um, sort of you know uh, current underscore env function um, as a way of of maintaining that. that that's what I understood. Um, I don't know if anyone has any different things, but. Um, and then the second way, I, I guess one, one of the things I was trying to think is like, why would I want to do this? It's the same old thing over and over again, right? Why the hell would I want to do this? Can anybody help me here? It's like, I don't I don't know why I'd want to extend execution environment. But then again, you know, it's well established that I'm, I'm on the struggle bus with some of this stuff. So <laughs> yeah. any thoughts about um, why? The only thing I could think of was just experimenting and trying to understand how R works. Otherwise, I don't know why you'd ever do that either. For that part now the second example about you know function factories then i can understand it but yeah yeah that seems to be like a, a key uh, which is right. actually a whole chapter in the book so if you don't understand function factories right now <laughs> chapter 10 will yeah the way to go <laughs> yeah so yeah and i didn't fully understand this idea so basically he talks about using the plus um uh function factory yeah so you're basically saying okay use make make a function that takes a takes a function as a, as an input, yeah. This is um, it's hard. You know, that's going to be an interesting thing to learn. But I'm still kind of out to sea on like all, how to make sense of that. But I mean, that's um, something I do use quite a bit. Of function factors. Like if I'm doing a simulation, I like like a function factory that'll generate the simulation function, but then it still needs to be called with specific arguments for that particular simulation I want to do. Yeah. Um, that way I can call it with different arguments and not have to keep all those same arguments over and over again, just the, the few that are changing. Usually the, the one that the one that's changing is the number of, you know, simulation iterations or something, but. Yeah. Um, so then they talk about call stacks and so now moving on from ex execution, you know, which is, you know, um, yeah, so this, this idea of call stacks, which um, I guess it kind of, I mean, like, you know, this makes sense to me, like, you know, we, when we learn about functions, there's always this kind of nested idea. So I'm assuming yeah. like call stack has something to do with the nesting or the sort of interrelatedness of these various functions. And so, um, yeah, so, um, oh, and also, wait a minute, why did it? Yeah, there's, there's a reason for this. Oh, yeah, because of this doesn't work. So they talked about trace back as a way of sort of looking at, um, you know, sort of like, okay, where where is are we going wrong here, right? So 
we have you know this uh, you know the f you know function gets fed into here, um, but then of course we have these other things taking over for that, and oh, and we can also do um, this this lobster way of it's obviously it's reversed, but it kind of gives you like the same kind of thing. I don't know, like I. I Oh, okay. I, I was a little bit on the struggle with this too. So we basically have two pieces, which is um, that, you know, when we execute a function, it creates two types of context, the execution environment, which we just talked about, which is the child of the functional environment. And this idea of the call stack, which is, I guess, just a way of like representing the interrelatedness, like, you know, like, like I'm doing here, right? Like I'm showing hierarchically and started F and we go through H, right? Um, yeah, execution order is the way yeah. I kind of think of it. And I yeah. think of it as like, I really think the call stack is important for debugging because part right. of debugging is knowing that something's wrong. The second part of de debugging is knowing where it's wrong. And so the part of knowing where it's wrong is that call stack because the call stack will walk you through the functions that got called. Right. And so you can better identify, okay, where is this? You could, you are better off being able to identify where the problem is happening. And right. so, and it's nice here because the two that he shares is like traceback is like the base version of the call stack. But then with Lobstar, the CST, it makes a little bit more intuitive sense because it's doing it in like chronological order rather than right. from like top to bottom. It goes from like bottom to top and right. it's just easier to read. Like the stop is the stop is the last thing that happens, and yet it's the first thing we see in the in the, in the trace back. Yeah, um, and then last, like you know, one concept that I think Ron, you just made mention to this about you know this idea of lexical versus dynamic scoping. So lexical scoping is about going up different levels in the environment, right? And but dynamic scoping is about looking at variables in a call stack. So somewhere in this stack is that does uh, is anyone i i didn't fully understand that i mean i'm still i, mean, I, I do remember learning about dynamic scoping you know initially but yeah i think about lexical yeah scoping. i mean basically you wouldn't dynamic scoping just means whatever the variable is right now during the execution like you say in the call stack look you know that is what it's going to be during this execution of the function like if i if i was using a variable that was free like uh you know named y or something to be whatever y happened to be at that time Right. In, in the lexical scoping, it's, it's whatever the variable is at when at the time you define the function. Right. And I better have it better have some kind of definition at that time. Right. Yeah. Um, I mean, it is possible to do some kinds of dynamic scoping in R when you yeah. want to, if you really want to. <laughs> yeah, but I think, yeah, OK. Well, anyway, that was what I, I got covered together um, for for chapter seven um chapter eight was a little bit easier but i spent so much time on trying to finish this up like yesterday and today that like chapter seven that i'm i'm still kind of like i said i'm i'm not fully understanding this but let me just um kind of talk about the outline um this idea of you know signaling conditions right and so what are conditions conditions are things that are going well or, or or properly or not properly or erroneously so um, we'll talk about things like try and um, suppress uh, messages and suppress warnings and stuff like that to um, kind of allow us to work through them without getting stopped by them or getting messed with I will say that like I don't know about y'all but like when I am like trying to do like some kind of porto thing or whatever um, like where I'm trying to like load packages in a Porto file, a lot of times I will put that suppressed messages in front of stuff because I'm so sick of R trying to tell me like, oh, hey, we did this thing for you. It's like, no, stop. You can, no, all, you can do that with uh, with the code block too, like messages equals false or something like that. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Is it different in Quarto maybe? I'm thinking R markdown, yeah. so maybe it's different in Quarto. But... but anyway, yeah, I mean, like, so obviously this is probably not something good to do in all cases, but I think, you know, since loading libraries i mean i guess i don't know maybe i can't think of a reason why i wouldn't want to do this right maybe it's like there's some problem with like the library loading that there's some kind of like issue that i'm not aware of maybe it would be a problem but i can't think of it so um yeah. sometimes sometimes there's like if you're like uh, sometimes if you're like 
making a call to an API, like, mm -hmm. and if the API is like really verbose on its output, sometimes I'll use suppress message. Like there's some functions that I use from other packages that interface with APIs and those APIs just return a ridiculous amount of like information. Yeah. So it's like, just suppress this message, you know? So that's where I find it useful sometimes. Oh, interesting. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, so anyway, the condition system allows us, the author of a function to indicate something unusual is happening. So there's there's three conditions, errors, warnings, and messages. And I felt like this felt really comfortable to me because even though I'm not like a proper developer, we've all lived in this, this world of, oh, it's only a warning or it's only a message? Good. I, I'm going to, you know, it's like, I'm going to keep rolling, you know, um, whereas the errors are obviously, um, and actually, if I had to be honest about something, probably like the, one of the biggest things that I, I want to learn about how to write functions and packages is how to create good, like warnings and error and control. I mean, I think this, this might actually be the domain that I, I need the most sort of, I, I think I need the most instruction on because yeah, I mean, you want, you want to be able to tell like if you've done the wrong thing or, you know what I mean? You want to be able to like, identify you know un, un, um, unintended consequences or, or whatever um yeah so anyway um and then like specifically i think writing good error messages is something that like i've never done a good job on in fact i've written functions where like i don't write any error stuff and then like i think oh it's rocking and rolling and then i find out wait a minute there was some unintended consequence or something that you know i didn't you know so yeah, this would probably be one of those things where you look at good like documentation, you look at good package stuff, you know, they usually have, you know, really uh, in, you know, meaningful um, error messages. That seems like to me, I don't know about y'all, but like that seems to me like a good sort of um, thing to have in a, in a package. Um, so um, yeah, warnings are obviously you know, it's less sort of concerning because we, you know, um, we can, you know, we can, there's something wrong, but we can at least, you know, get through it for the most part. Um, and in fact, um, they mentioned that there's only a couple of cases where, you know, using a warning is appropriate over throwing an error. I mean, I think probably common sense would be like, you know, don't use a warning when an error is really what you need, right? Don't don't make it sound like it's not serious when it is, you know what I mean? Or in, and in fact, maybe like what they're really trying to say is, is the authors is, you know, warnings are, um, you know, uh, they're dangerous if, you know, you, you, you don't fully understand um, what could happen. In fact, that's the second sort of, so deprecation is one reason for using warnings. And I, I don't know about you, but like, this is another one of the banes of my existence where it's like, I've written code six months ago on how to like filter and merge and munge all my data. And then it's like, I, I got my little like um, select, you know, tidy, you know, what do you call it? Helper, tidy helper functions, tidy select or whatever, blah, blah, blah. And crap, they've changed it. And so now it's like, I'm throwing all these errors. Of, oh, we've deprecated this, you know, if this will. And then I think a lot of times they have a, a setup where it'll only, it will only show you that warning once per session, which is pretty slick, right? You know, instead of every time you try to like run it, it it, it just runs it the first time. And then this one, the second one, which is when you're reasonably certain you're going from the problem, which is, it just seems like you're asking for trouble, <laughs> you know, to to assume such a thing. I don't know. Well, I mean, but then again, I, I've also not fully taken advantage of all control structures. So this is news to me. So, um, yeah, so any of their messages are just, you know, telling you what they performed. And so that could be anything from loading a package to, um, yeah. So actually there are some pack, I don't know if you you guys have seen this. I forget what the name of it is. It's some dplyr or some um, tidyverse package that like, um, when you write a bunch of like, you know, select or filter functions in dplyr, after you're done, it, re it, it returns a message of like how many rows were filtered out. You know what I'm talking about, Colin? Like what's the name of that damn thing? I can't even remember but uh, uh, I used it one time. Yeah. I can't remember what it was, but the, the issue that I found with it was it just was, it was just too verbose for me Yeah, because like, it, it would just clutter. Like it's that idea of messages and it. And they even mentioned in the book was like, yeah, you can, you can do messages, you can do warnings, but like, if you have a lot of output, they just get lost in the shuffle. And that's what I felt happened with that package. But, oh, uh, what was that call? That was like. Uh, summer R or some summary R or uh, yeah, I, 
I'll, I'll see if I can do some digging around in for it. But yeah, yeah I've used it. It's not that like, important, but I just I guess I just meant like the whole purpose of that that package is to do messages, right? I mean, that's all we're, you know, it's all it's just taking um what you do and telling you, hey, we did this for you. I mean, I will say this, I used it for one thing where like I had to go through like six months worth of like data, you know, at the at the hospital. And man, there was just so many different like filtering and and, and like subgrouping and like, you know, identifying of this. And so I felt I thought it was really interesting because it was verbose, but at least I had it like in case, you know, like a year from now, I'm like, you know, how many people got filtered out? It can just tell they'll just leave it there for me as a way. They also talk about like a fourth control structure, which is just this interrupt, which, you know, we're all probably familiar with this, you know, it's just, you know, pressing escape or, you know, control alt, whatever, C or whatever. And um, yeah, so those are all sort of control structures or whatever um i don't want to i don't want to i don't want to uh take over the conversation but i want to yeah. kind of go back to your, the idea with the um with the idea of the summary r or whatever it was yes like i kind of it kind of goes back with the argument in the book again which is like hey you know you should be using errors over messages Right. And the, what I was thinking is, is, you know, the summary R package, I'm sure there's a utility for it, but I'm sitting right. there thinking like, if you know the structure of your data, it should just be an error, right? Like, well, maybe not, maybe you don't always know the structure of your data, but like, no, yeah. I was, I, I, like, so for example, this example that I'm talking about is like, we're trying to look at like every migraine patient seen over like a five-year period. And, you know, there's also like weird, like exclusionary inclusionary criteria so there'd be like a section where I'm like, okay, remove everybody that only came to the clinic one time in a, in a five-year period, right? And so mm. um, I'll create some kind of like um, function call where I'll be like filter and then, you know, and then, um, I mean, another way you could just do it is you don't have to do the messages. You could just create like, you know, the the, the to be filtered out people as a, as a separate sort of um, data frame and just, you know, use descriptives to kind of tell you, okay, this is how many people, I mean, it depends on what you want to do with it, I guess is what I'm trying to say, but. Anyway. Yeah. Cause, cause I had, cause it's just, cause I was thinking is then why wouldn't you just use a test that like, you know, there's like, yeah. cause then what you would have is basically if that test does not fail, then your code keeps running. Right. But if it right. fails, it would be an error, but I guess I could understand where you come from because sometimes you don't necessarily know. Yeah. You want absolutely. some summary information outputted. So I guess yeah. it just depends on your use case, I guess. I, I think my use case, man, I think what you're talking about is you're talking about cleaning a sort of design study that you kind of have expectations of this is how many people, and this is what they should look like. And what I'm saying is, is I'm in like this murky hell zone of like, okay, let's try to figure out like, what's a usable sample, you know, in this big murky data sets. But I think your point is absolutely correct. Like if I was doing your way, I'd want to have it be like a test just and have it fail if I'm not meeting those, if I my expectations aren't being met, you know what I mean? But yeah, for, exactly. for what, what I was doing was just like, man, it was like, you know, this big amorphous kind of, and this is a common thing in like observational research where you have existing data that you just, you know, you need to kind of clean through. Um, so anyway, yeah, they, they, uh, the next thing is ignoring conditions. This is another one of those, like, why would I do this, um, in real life other than like, you know, if I'm just trying to like work through like some, you know, a function to try to figure out how, what's, what's problematic about it, but, you know, try as a way of ignoring errors. And we've already talked about suppress warnings, suppress messages. So like, if we were to create this, um, you know, um, this function here, which, I, by the way, I didn't put the previous one, One, which was if I just had, forget the try, it was if I removed the try and just had log X, it would just throw an error, right? Um, but if we do the try, even though this is totally um, whacked, um, uh, you know, this isn't appropriate log, you know, um, it, it, still tr it still does this, right? So it still tries to apply this. Um, yeah. Does anybody um, know what it's treating um, A as? Well, it'd be a character, right? You can't take a log of a character, right? It has to be right. A, but it, it, it's, it's it's giving me it, it's oh excuse me it's it's you're right right. I'm sorry, I'm totally spacing here. Right. So it's 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 throwing the error for that, um, but then it's giving me the ten, right? And so yeah, you're right. I'm sorry, I was. 
I was making this more complicated than I, than I needed the way I was describing it. You're right. So this part, it, 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 it tries it, it throws the air, but the part that can run still runs. Now, why you would want to do that, God knows. I just can't even imagine. I mean, I guess, you know, like you're trying to, like, if you, I mean, this is obviously a pretty trivial piece of a function just to have the number 10, but maybe there's like a whole other set of calculations that you'd want to do that are independent of the log X part. So you'd be like, okay, there's like A, B, and C parts, and like this is the A part here, and so this is throwing an error, but the B and C or whatever the other parts are at least working, I guess. I don't know. I I, I kind of came across this because I guess this is one direct application of what I've been kind of working on is like, so part of my job is we do some forecasts for some things. Right. And so what I've been thinking about is, well, because there's a lot of steps within it, to do like a forecast, like you have to check a lot of assumptions and, you know, do a lot of data exploration, which is just creating a lot of plots. Right. And then you create your model, but you know, in the forecasting space, like if you're doing like a simple ARIMA model, you can just do an auto ARIMA and right. it will just figure out the model for you. Right. And so what you could do is, you know, you could still like have a function that's going to output like a list of different objects, like plots, assumption checking, so on and so forth, model output. But what happens in a case where an ARIMA model won't work? Yeah. So what you could do is you could force the try on the model fitting, but still get the summary information, like the plotting information to get outputted in like a list object. So you just call, like subset out that list. I don't know. I was just kind of thinking of it when you said that, because I was like, oh, this would be a great opportunity because if it's if you're auto fitting a model, which you shouldn't necessarily be auto fitting a model, but Depends on what just, you're trying to do, you know. I mean, depends you're... on what you're trying to do, and like if you know, I have a lot of different like models that I need to create, so I can't necessarily check every single assumption. So okay. it's just like, well, maybe if if I just force it with try, you know, I can still get that summary information, but then if it errors out when it's doing like the model creating, you know, creating the model, then you know, I just go dig into that object. But that was just what I was thinking. You could use a yeah. I think I think yeah I think we're I think we're learning the biggest um, lesson of this whole group is going to be like figuring out use cases and figuring out ways of because the way that it's applied I mean the way it's discussed is pretty abstract in the book and yeah I mean a lot and a lot of these functions are trivial you know what I mean where it's like you have you know the the, the function is just log x and then the, the number 10 underneath it's like yeah I mean how often are you going to run into that as like a thing you know but you know as we get more into this and i i do want to spend a little bit of time next week because uh, i didn't get all the way through uh, there's some examples that i kind of wanted to to try that i just wasn't going to have a, a chance to do that so anyway this idea of handling conditions right so this handling is just another way of temporarily or supplementing or overriding the default behavior so try catch is um you know it's basically like the 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 i guess it's like try, but um, it, it, it returns the, the, to the context uh, from where try catch was called. Um, so this was, you know, they talk about try catch as being like the good way of dealing with errors, right? Whereas messages and um, warnings are like with this, with calling um, handlers. So um, yeah, so basically like, you know, with this, the second uh, function, you're, um, you know, we're sort of returning the context where the, the condition was signaled, um, which is kind of what, you know, you want with messages and, and warnings and whatnot. Um, yeah. Um, and then also another kind of thing, like they made reference to this idea of exiting handlers, which is just, you know, handlers where, you know, once a certain thing that you're looking for happens, you just, you kind of are, um, you exit, you know, um, the, the, the code once you know, you've reached that, that sort of condition. Um, yeah, and then they talk, the last thing I kind of got into was this idea of condition, you know, objects, right? So, um, you know, which is, um, these are all like, I guess they made, they made mention of this idea. These are all F S3 kinds of objects, which of course, and you know, we've seen in like the namespace and other, other parts. So this it seems like it's an important thing. Um, so they talk about catch. Um, underscore CND uh, as a, um, you know, to see what's going on with the condition object from the signal condition, which means we've, we've met some condition for something to happen. So there's, we have, you know, the message and, you know, the call. Um, so, um, 
yeah so like this was one example of um oh yeah i had something profound about this that i i, I saw so conditions also have class attributes which makes them s3 so so right here we're, we have a, a, a function called message which just basically returns um you know there um and yeah why why i forget why is this not i forget um oh yeah i had a total brain fart here so yeah i'm trying to remember like why isn't this being run or why um yeah maybe this is like a next week thing but well, um okay I, I see what I see what you're trying to say here. Well, basically it's like it's running in this context of like if it has message, right? You have message here. Right. But because your handler code is, hey, if you see a message, if you see a message in the attribute, run this function here, which is there. And because it's an exit handler, once it runs that handler, it stops and it just returns there. Yeah, try catches all oh, never go back to or, unlike the uh, handle conditions or it's called. So if I erase this, what happens? Or if I, you know, is there, is there a way for me to do that? No, I don't even think there is. Well, if you just take the inner part, then the, you get the default message handler, which is not a try catch, but rather the other thing. What's it called? Handle conditions? I forgot now. Uh, I mean, the default, you handler, the default handler for messages is not, um, yeah, if you got rid of that line, put a comment symbol, put a hash pound in front of the message there, I guess. No, you need something, don't you? Um, um, I guess you need something. Let's see. Oh, well, there you go. Well, you need something in that first argument for the try catch. I guess you could put oh. error equals nothing. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Like this is, this is like, you can see, like, this is where I, yeah. I just got into this, like after lunch and like my brain was, I'm just like, what the heck is going on here? So yeah, probably this is, this is, we're going to need more of this anyway. So let me stop here. Just because but the, the, the point is that the try catch will always, when it catch, whatever catches, it's not giving it back. Right. It's a one way right. road. Whereas the, with calling handlers, I guess it's called that one will return call back control back. Right. Yeah, it goes back to the context, right, that it yeah. was running in, which is in that block of code. So right. it will finish running that out in the in the message handler, right? Yeah. So, yeah, anyway, this was, I, I really was hoping to, I mean, I basically were, um, I was like, uh, I'm trying to think where, like, you know, I'm basically like someplace around here, I guess. Um, yeah. My other, my other question that Close I had... My other question that I had with this was, um, if you go back to your code there, yeah. Well, well, I guess my other question is, is like, what is it using in, in try catch? What is it using? So we have that condition object. So a condition object gets created, right? Right. So what is it using? Is it using the attribute? Is it using that attribute? Like, if attribute contains, and I don't know what the logic is, but if attribute contains the string, like message then yeah, run this based, code it's based on the class not oh the, not, yeah because yeah. the attribute is the class yeah yeah it's not true yeah the class attribute then when you define custom handlers you can define your own things and put your own things in there you know that makes sense now I think okay, we're like okay. the case when type thing i guess but yeah that's what I was thinking, but I was wondering what data object it was using, but now it makes sense with the condition object. It has an attribute. Called class. It's got a class. Called yeah. class, right? And it and, and in this case, when it's looking at this error class, like it's looking for either three things, simple error, error, or condition. And if it has one of those class attributes, then it will push the message. Where does the call come in? I don't understand. Like it says call force expression. Yeah, well, like I said, it's just, <laughs> yeah, we need to, I think it's good that we need another week on this. And I mean, I think that's, um, you know, I will, uh, I think I can, um, I can knock out this in like 20 minutes next week. And then, um, 
Well, one possibility is if um, I noticed that the next section functional program actually has like a sub uh, like an introductory section, which is not a chapter, which is a couple. Oh, right. Oh. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I, I guess work it out with um, Robert, but maybe he would want to just at least cover that part and then get yeah. back to chapter nine. I don't know. It's just a thought. Pretty short yeah. though. I mean, it's not like it's it's it kind of. I mean, no, uh, it is. No, I look at it, it's pretty short, but it could be a lot of discussion. <laughs> yeah, that's true. It's true. Yeah. Actually, I, I think know, that's not. where they. I think that's the where the idea of the first class functions came in was the introduction part. Actually, right. Yeah, I haven't even gotten to that yet. So. Oh yeah, there it is. Functions first class functions. Yeah. I thought it came up in the functions chapter, but maybe it didn't. I remember us talking about it because we were talking about. I think it was like when we were talking about objects, right? When we were talking mm -hmm. about it was probably like names and values or even maybe even vectors we were talking about this idea of first class yeah that, right. um, but i don't think we've been introduced to it just yet but now, now we're going to get introduced to it again so yeah it was briefly in chapter six uh in function fundamentals we talked about it, but now it's going to talk about it some more yeah so that's going to be good so I guess in hindsight, I probably wouldn't have been able to finish anyway. Kind of. Do you want? It's, it's a lot. I mean, it's, it's a lot. lot. Chapter yeah. chapter eight is quite a bit. I mean, yeah. No. Anyway, it's uh, you know. I mean, I'm glad we got to get into it. And yeah, like, I think what I'm going to try to do is um, for next week is um, like, uh, like. Some of these applications right like so this actually was i, I didn't I, I kind of glanced at this and i was like man I, this is what we need to be talking about because these are like real examples you know we're not just putting the number 10 in some place in the output like this is creating like conditions yeah. that get triggered so like that's why i was like i want to spend more time on this um so i will I will get I'll take 20 minutes next time and then we can yeah I mean we could just do like the intro to the the function stuff I mean that may be enough I don't know or maybe you just want to let Robert know say hey Robert we're running behind on this so you're going to be yeah. short on time do you want to just you yeah know, can, how we want to deal with it but one suggestion is maybe just we could get to the introductory part of the functional yeah. section or maybe yeah. he's like no no I'll just kind of crank through who knows but yeah yeah, yeah I, no, mean, I think I think yeah. I think that'd be good I think we could probably do that either way you know um so yeah good uh good times and um we're a little bit back on track ish i guess so uh, hopefully next week we get we get robert back and yeah yeah this is tough material so it is yeah. man yeah it is and it's like um you know i've been I, I i meant to do this over the weekend but the football i'm not gonna lie <laughs> anyway. um, it probably didn't help Dude, I, I had some wagers this weekend that were stressful i'm, I'm not gonna i had a four legger right there and I had a four legger that it, all the legs except the cowboys. I had the four legger. I admit the bills crushed me. Man. <laughs> all right, this is neither here nor there. Um, so um, yeah, but no, I, I, I what I really like to do is create like some functions of things that I'm trying to do, and like you know incorporate some of these things as a way of kind of like you know doing them. You know what I mean? Because it's like you, I think you got to find all of these things. Um, you got to you got to find ways of using them because it's like. Otherwise, it's just your understanding is so abstract. I don't know. Like, that's my thing. So, yeah. Yeah. The, the struggle is, is like with the error handling, it's like how much, you know, like. Right. Because it comes down to the fact of like, and Hadley talks about this. I can't remember where, not in the book, but somewhere between the idea of like use R versus develop R, right? Use R, you're using it more for interactive analysis. Develop R, you're using R to create tools for other people. And yeah. so it's like the error or handling yourself. Or, yourself. or yourself. And yeah. I could understand spending time to do the error handling, like, you know, like as an iterative process, but it's like, how much can you actually put into like packages that, you know, is code that runs in isolation or only is run by you, you yeah. know? So it's like, yeah, you can do all this try catch variation stuff, but like, are you going to spend two, three hours writing like a try catch? or like a, you know, a, a, a custom call handler for one function that you call maybe like once. Yeah. Know? But I, I you know, I think what's really important is like the idea that gets mentioned here of like, it's important to know this stuff because not only do you need to know it as a developer, but you also need to know like when you get yeah. confronted, confronted with it. Right. 
So, yeah. Yeah. No, it's funny. Like I, um, I'm like, I'm one of the main, like our kind of like, you know, zealots in my organization. And I was doing some like live coding for people and I, Ooh, um, that's scary. Yeah, I know it sucks. I'm always like, I, I swear to God, man, like, you know, like I want to be like David Robinson, man. Like that guy is just like, he just like straight, just like, it's like, you know, like it's like Mozart just, just, yeah. you know, just you know, it comes out of him, you know, but um, yeah, man, I, I'm, I'm, I, I, anyway, like I, I ended up running into some errors and I'm like, what is this? And I'm like, you know, of course I'm not like, you know, debugging in real time, but I am definitely like looking like a fool. And so, yeah, to be, it would be nice if I could be a little more understanding of what's going on, but um, yeah, say la vie. <laughs> yeah, I teach this, I teach this and let's just say I, I teach, I teach a basics class. I, we talk about the tidyverse, but it's like, where do you teach that class? Where is, where is uh, it? I teach at university of Nebraska Lincoln. Um, oh, wow. Teach, yeah. So I teach, I teach this, but it's like basic, just tidyverse stuff, like, you know, group by summarize, like really simple stuff, but yeah. well, even then I, I don't want to live code in front of them. It's like, I'm going to have my notes ready. I'm going to yeah. have my notes all ready and just run them because it's like, even, even when I'm in front of like, you know, people that are like completely unfamiliar with it, it's like, uh, we're not, we're not live coding today. Nope. Yeah. People so, that can do that, man. They're special for sure. Yes. Yeah. Well, next week y'all. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. I think we'll finish up. We'll finish up the rest of chapter eight. I can reach out to, to Rob and say, uh, Hey, we're kind of running behind, um, you know, do you think you can just cover like the introduction part of it? Yeah. I feel like he's going to be happy with that because he's so good with other things. Kind of do too. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully he's been kept keeping up because we've, we've gone over like a lot of yeah. stuff. Like we've yeah. gone over quite well, a bit of stuff. Yeah. I mean, the nice yeah. thing is the, the functional thing is kind of like a little bit of a turn and yeah, not super dependent from what I could tell on everything that came before. But yeah, I mean, it's dependent on the basic stuff. It's not dependent on conditions or, right. you know. How familiar are you guys with like the per package? Um, I had used it a bunch, but I will say that like most times where I need to use it to create a, you know, a, a iteration thing, I'm usually like going through a bunch of iteration myself to get it to work. Why? What are you, what's going on? Oh, I was just wondering, I, cause when I read it, cause I'm, I'm I use like her all the time. And so I was just wanted to see, like when I was reading it, I was kind of happy with it because like, I was like, Oh, I'm really familiar with some of this stuff. But I was thinking that if you're not familiar with this, a good starting point is the iteration chapter from oh, right. for DS. Like if, if per is yeah. like completely foreign to you, like read the iteration no. chapter in R for DS, because it's like, yeah. No, I use per. I just not that much of an expert. At it. I, I mean, I know I basically am using a lot of, you know, map, you know, map two. And you can also use apply, various apply functions. I mean, like that's the thing. I mean, you don't need to use per. It's just super slick if you can. Yeah. Which I didn't necessarily know was known was a functional, but we'll talk about it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. All right, y'all. All right. Well, cool. Yeah, well, it's great All talk right. with everybody. I'll see everybody yeah. next see week. Next week. Yes, sir. Take care. Yeah.